This is Bob Allen, and this is Libertarian Viewpoint. Uh, this show is to help educate you concerning libertarian alternatives to the government solutions that we've all been handed uh, from officials uh, that never include anything individual orientated. So, uh, I've got a guest here, Mary Ruart, mm -hmm. and I, I thank you for being on the show, Mary. Well, it's my pleasure. <laughs> and you're from Texas, right? I am now, yes. Originally from Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose you could, you could get a job with the uh, the car industry, or <laughs> well, I'm a scientist by training, John. so I was at Upjohn in Kalamazoo for many years. I, I hear you. Uh, that, that sounds like a very good job. But like that was in the is it pharmaceuticals? Or? Yes, it was. Yes, it is. And you know what I learned there is how much. FDA regulation actually impedes the development of new cures. It's added about 10 years to the development time of drugs. And when we were doing AIDS research, when we were ready finally, and the FDA allowed us to test in humans, every AIDS patient in the country had already had our drug because they hired black market chemists to make them and had distributed them throughout the AIDS community. They could not wait the extra 10 years. It was a matter of life and death. And of course, it would as far as human trials go, I mean, that would be the almost the ultimate, other than there's no blind placebo type. Of that's right. And that's why the courts ruled against the cancer patients recently. The Supreme Court wouldn't even hear the case. The cancer patients sued. They said, let us buy, not get, just buy what the pharmaceutical companies have in their pipeline once they've gone through the human safety testing. We won't know if they're effective, but you know we can't wait because that's the longest part of the trial. We need them now. And the court said, you have no right to try to save your life that way. Uh, I'm curious, uh, how many people do you think die during this waiting period? I've actually calculated. Because the drugs that are on the market now, we know how many lives they save. And we know how much delay they've encountered based on the 1962 regulations. So we can calculate them at 4.1 million minimum. No, is, uh, over how many years would that be? That would be since 62. I think I made the calculation from 1962 to 2003. You know, that's more deaths uh, that U.S. citizens have experienced in all the wars since well, this country's been public. And you know what, Bob? That's just the beginning. Just the beginning. Because there are many drugs that never make it to the market because of these regulations. I'll, I'll give you an example of what happened uh, to a drug I was working on. It was prostaglandins for liver disease. And I actually got a call from the FDA commissioner in my or F FDA examiner for my division. And he said to me, Dr. Ruart, I understand you have a patent now. You've filed a patent for prostaglands and liver disease. Is that true? I said, yes, we just did that. He said, I am so excited. Liver disease kills 100,000 people every year, and there's no cure. We just send people home for bed rest. You know, this could make a big difference. So we'll help you any way we can. Well, I was excited. You know, I thought, oh, finally, we'll get something on the market. But of course, the FDA had to follow its own regulations which meant that we had to have two trials in the United States showing effectiveness. And it has to be at a certain statistical significance. And I know you and your listeners may not know what that means, but it means that we have to have lots of people so that we know that this wasn't a chance occurrence, like a roll of the dice. Yes. And so what, what, uh, what happened was, even with the FDA's help, we realized that you know, liver disease is a chronic disease. We'd have to have people taking the drug for a long time. We were the first ones to ever attempt to cure it, so we wouldn't know how long to give the drug, what dose to give. We didn't know how many patients we needed to enroll. We weren't sure exactly what we needed to look for. We didn't want to wait until the people died, obviously. It'd be better to look at another parameter that, you know, changed swiftly. By the time we figured all this out, we realized that if we didn't guess all these things right the first time, we'd have to repeat this long, long study. And by the time we got the drug to market, we'd go generic. We'd never recover our costs. So we decided not to develop it, even though the FDA really wanted us to. It just is too difficult. Now, uh, 
other countries like Germany or England, uh, even Japan, uh, will quite often, years ahead of us, That's right. already approve drugs. Now, what are they approving them based on? Well, every country has a different system for drug approval. And because the United States made such stringent regulations in 1962 and made them in a way that they get to grow every year, um, we have some of the most rigorous regulations in the world. So in other countries, they don't have to go through all the hoops. So other Europeans get about twice as many drugs as we do, for example, new drugs. And when we get them, the same drugs, we get them a lot later than they do. Well, what is the uh, cost? Uh, I mean, obviously, I, I heard at one point, you know, just to get it, one drug to the market, yes. and all the testing was $400 million. What would be the cost for a drug now? And how much would that impact the cost of drugs? Okay, well, um, it's about $1.2 billion in 15 years. And that $1.2 billion includes the cost of capital, you know, over that 15 years. It's about $600 million without that. It's about, you know, a factor of two when you just count the out-of-pocket costs. Sure. And at the amount you pay at the pharmacy, about 80% of that amount are due to these regulations that were passed in 1962. These regulations that harm us instead of help us. So, uh, not only but do these drugs kill us uh, at a rate of, was it, uh, you We said? had 4.1 million people just dying from the delays. But, you know, I just gave you an example of a drug that never made it to market. Yes. Okay. Well, if that's, you know, that's some creative type of, of new drug. And you can actually calculate roughly how many drugs we lose. We know we lose at least 50% of our drugs that never make it to market because of these regulations. So if you assume that they're as effective as the drugs that are on the market now, that's another 16.4 million lives. That's a lot of people dying. In fact, I calculate that maybe one out of three or four people who have died since 1962 died prematurely because of these regulations. So no testing was done. Mm -hmm. Say we simply introduced these to the market mm -hmm. uh, without the FDA. How many people would die from the just from the drugs without the testing? Well, if we go back to what was happening um, in between uh, 1930 and 1962, we can actually make that calculation because we know roughly how many negative or, or bad drugs got to market, even though there was some testing. There was safety testing, but no effectiveness testing. That was what the big change was. And it's about, um, it's about uh, I think we calculated about 7,000 people would have died I mean, these regulations might protect 7,000 people. Over the same time that... Uh, that kills 4.1 million from delays and about 16 million from lack of innovation. So we're that doesn't seem like a, a, a good trade-off, does no, it? No, it's not. It's not at all. And I'm guessing that the, the drug companies don't want to tell the public this. I mean, we're, we're told about all the money they have and so forth, but the reality is, is they're regulated. Their drugs don't get to market, and the government used their laws punitively, and so if they spoke out, uh, they would be ruined. Correct. That is exactly correct, and that's why, um, and that's why when I speak out about it, I always get people from the research industry coming up and saying, I'm so glad somebody's saying something, because they don't dare. And you know, it's not just that. I mean, everybody's affected by this. Even the FDA is affected by this because they're people too, right? They're gonna die without a cure. Yeah. And, and not only that, there's a bunch of preventative stuff we would have done if these regulations hadn't been passed. You see, for example, Upjohn, the company I worked for, made vitamin E. Most drug companies were making vitamins back about the time that these regulations were passed. And vitamins were going to become the next big Thing. You know, one a day multiple vitamins. I think you're probably old enough to remember those was put out by a pharmaceutical firm. And so 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 the companies were getting into prevention. But once these regulations passed, they couldn't do that anymore. And that was because when they go to a doctor and try to tell them what new stuff is out there for them to use, um, the FDA won't allow them to talk about anything that hasn't gone through this process that costs six hundred million out of pocket costs and one point two billion in capitalized costs. Well, something like vitamin E is not patentable. So you can never recover your cost. It goes generic the first day, and you never recover that money. 